Well, hey, Church of the Highlands, how you guys doing here at Grants Mill? Y'all good? Okay. Well, we're doing great here, and I believe the same thing is true at every campus. So honored to join you guys at every location. We love you a ton. Of course, everybody joining us online and the incredible men and women of our Alabama Correctional Facilities. One more time here in every location. Let's put our hands together. It is so great. So great to be together as a church family and just excited for all God has been doing. I sense his presence here today. I'm full of faith today that God has something special in store for each of us in our time together and just so honored to be here as we finish out our Unpopular Opinion series. We've been talking, uh, if you happen to be here for the first time, go back and watch it because we've been talking about relationships for the last few weeks and it's been amazing. I'm excited to be here today. Um, before we jump into that though, just a couple things for you guys to know. Um, starting next week, everybody say next week. We are launching a brand new series. I'm, a, I'm so excited about this one. Uh, PC will be back to launch it. And if you've been around Highlands, you know every, so often every few months we do a Bible study, a more focused kind of verse by verse study. And that's what we're starting next week. And I'm really excited because we're gonna look at the, the last seven days, the last week of Jesus' life on earth as we lead up to Easter, everybody. And it's gonna be amazing. So big idea here, don't miss it. Be sure you're here. We're even gonna have, we're even gonna have the, uh, the booklets we had in the Beatitudes series for you to follow along. And so it's gonna be powerful. It's gonna be an amazing time together. And this has just been a special year. This is the year at Highlands. We're believing this is the year of great faith. Say that out loud, great faith. And I believe these, sermon, these sermons and messages around the last week of Jesus are gonna build our faith in a really big way. And then we're gonna celebrate at Easter together, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It's gonna be special. And then secondly, last thing before we jump in God's word, I just wanna take a moment on behalf of Highlands College uh, and my opportunity kind of to represent the entire team and say thank you. I wanna look around there. I wish I could sit down in front of every single one of you here and at every location. Thank you so much for believing in this vision. It's been an amazing year as we opened up our brand new facility and we had over 4,000 people come to our grand opening. And so maybe you were there. If you weren't there, here's just a picture kind of what it looked like all day long, literally a line out of the building. It was just a beautiful day. One of my favorite days ever in ministry, just shaking hands, hugging people, high-fiving people, and really celebrating, even if, you, even if you weren't there, we celebrated what we were able to do together. That's the power of this vision is we were able to do something amazing together as we have now a platform to train students, come on somebody, and release them into the world to bring the name of Jesus to the corners of this earth, every corner of this earth. That's what Highlands College is, is to take what God's done in us here to the entire world. And you are a part of that. So again, thank you so much for investing in it. It's amazing. And as, as great as this building is, I do want you to know, though, we are not finished. In fact, we're just getting started. Can I get an amen today? And so just a couple updates for you just to be excited about and pray for us. Uh, we're getting ready to finish our first student housing facility in, this, in the fall coming up. And I went there the other day and walked around. And honestly, I was a little bit jealous because it was so much better than my dorm in college. I was jealous. I'm like, this is amazing. And so we've, we've put a lot of time and energy into that vision uh, for this facility to make sure students can live in community. And that's such a healthy environment for them to learn in. And so that opens up here in a few months. And then this next facility is really exciting. This is actually a warehouse that's already on the property. The entire story of Highlands College is a God story. And we have this amazing warehouse we've used in different ways. In fact, starting next week, our Grandview campus is gonna meet here while their auditorium's uh, being renovated. But then when they move out, everybody, this is gonna become the Highlands College Rec Center. So our students can, yeah, I got, I got some amens for the Rec Center. It's so our students can have a health, healthy, active lifestyle. And that's just a little bit of a, a rendering, an early drawing of what that's gonna look like, sports fields and facilities. And so it's, it's just amazing. 70 acres of campus there, all built as a platform to, to really, our heart is to fulfill the Great Commission in our lifetime through a bunch of laborers out in the harvest field. Can I get an amen? You're a part of it. It's amazing. It's, no, it's amazing. So keep praying. And then last but not least, I just more of a celebration, but also an invitation. Because of your generosity, now over 10,000 of you who've given into Highlands College, we were able this past week to formulate and launch a new scholarship that is available for every Church of the Highlands traditional age student. So 18 to 24 year olds who are a part of this church. It's another thousand dollar scholarship towards their tuition. We have a dream that all of our students would graduate debt free and this is another step in that journey. So if you are one of those students, I know parents are excited to hear scholarship money is available, but if you're one of those students, 18 to 24, and you feel like you have a call of God on your life, 
come check out Highlands College. And our next preview day is, May, uh, is March 24th, March 24th here in a few weeks. So here, here's, a, here's our amazing 74,000 number. All right, so you can text HC info to learn about facilities, how to invest in scholarships, and also how to take your next step maybe in your journey if you're a student. And so again, this is just a miracle and it's so much fun to celebrate what, what God's doing. All right, part four of Unpopular Opinion. Now this series has been, I think it's been right on time. I feel like the crisis we've gone through over the last two years, and I don't even need to rehearse all the pieces of it, has really brought us, this crisis has brought us to a crossroads. And I think this, this year we've kind of been standing in that moment of decision. And you know, a crossroads always has some danger and opportunity. And, and the danger in this moment where we've all gone through pain, we've all gone through some uncertainty, is that we would choose a pathway that continues, kind of the popular opinion pathway that continues down a journey of trying to figure out life our own way. But I think if there is an opportunity from what we've all gone through, is that we would recognize our way is not working, and in this moment, we would instead take a different pathway, that we would take God's pathway. And that's the heart of this series. We've talked about relationships, you know, and it really the theme that the Holy Spirit has built around this has really been that if, if we want to see change in the relationships around us, it's going to start, that change has to start inside of us. I think that's been the opportunity of this incredible series. You know, we talked in week one about unconditional love, and that starts inside of us. And we talked in week two, Charlotte preached a great message about a change of perspective. And that, that starts inside of us. And of course, last week, PC talked about how, you know, we're not to be frustrated with this generation. I think there's, it's easy to say, well, y'all go get it right. But instead, come on, somebody, we're going to fight for this generation. And that change, that change starts inside of us. And even our marriage conference, we had over 4,500 couples in our campuses this weekend. Come on, any married couples at the conference? Anybody? All right, they're happy right now. They in love right now. Y'all, they may be kissing in the service. I don't even know what my God. But, but we talked about even there, the theme of that whole weekend for you guys that were there was really about how the, the change has to start inside of us. That's really though a very unpopular opinion. And I really wanna hit it hard today because it's, 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 a, it's a truth of God that we really need to dig into today. If we're gonna see relational change, we do need to understand that that change is gonna first start inside of us. And so if you wanna write down our title today, here, here we go. We're gonna hit it really hard. Unpopular opinion, a healthy me is the key to a healthy us. A healthy me, it is the key to a healthy us. And again, we would rather blame everybody else. That's, you know, that's, that's what the popular opinion would be. But if we want to see real change, it starts on the inside of us. And the hard part of that, let's just be really honest today. The hard part of that is we live in such an unhealthy climate. How can I possibly be? I was thinking about this question. You know, how can I possibly be, be healthy myself? Because I'm surrounded by such an environment that is unhealthy. And so I'm gonna give you language today. The things I'm about to share with you, you've heard these and you, you see these everywhere. But I think it's important for us to reflect on, if we're gonna be healthy, understand what we're up against and just kind of reflect on the moment we're living in. And here's the first kind of uh, attribute. Or we're, we're in the eye of this storm right here, kind of attribute of our culture. And that is we are seeing everywhere we look a deconstruction of the truth. We are truly living in a moment. It's been actually the last few decades building where we feel like we all have the right to develop our own truth, kind of our own you know, way of seeing the world around us and then to live by that, that we think we are smart enough or we've got it all together enough to figure out life ourselves. We can have our truth. Here's a great verse. I think, I think you guys would agree. This verse probably really summarizes the world we're living in right now from Judges 21. It said, in those days, Israel had no king and everybody just did as they saw fit. Isn't that true with what we're seeing around us? I'll do, my, I'll do life my way, you do life your way. And, and in some ways, you know, tolerance, we gotta make sure we understand tolerance, this idea of moral tolerance that's everywhere. Tolerance is a good thing when it's in its purest form. We, we recognize that people can disagree, but still value each other. But here's the wicked thing the enemy's done. And kind of in this culture, the enemy's made us believe that if someone disagrees with us, we will go after them. That like ideas are more important than people. That my truth is more important than you. And you have no right to tell me what to do. And if you come after my truth, I will come after you. And of course, we're seeing that everywhere, this, this deconstruction of the truth. Here's the second one, and this is, this is massive. A disillusionment with our lives that we have just, we, found, we, we just are walking through life and it feels meaningless, that we in, in so many ways are blessed, but we're, we've lost the enjoyment of life. Here's, here's a, a quote that summarizes it. Never has any one culture had so much 
and enjoyed so little. I mean, that is so true. I mean, we have blessed ourselves into misery. I mean, think about it right now. We're covered. We have an amazing roof over our heads, right? And it's been raining all day. Anybody thankful we have a roof over our heads, right? So blessed. In the winter, we have uh, heat. And in the summer, the humid summer of Alabama, we have air conditioner, right? And we either are swimming in a pool, the lake, or we're inside our houses all summer long. We're blessed, right? Come on, we are so blessed. And at least if you're a Christian out there, you have an iPhone, right? If you have an Android, we'll talk about that later, right? But... <laughs> But you iPhone people who can text each other in blue bubbles and not green, and it's just so healthy. And, you know, I only have a few friends I can tolerate. I'm just kidding. But, but, but no, but our devices, right? I mean, that's just technology, but it's a blessing. They say that the iPhone has replaced over 40 different devices. Think about it. You don't need a camcorder on your shoulder anymore. You have one on your phone, right? You have a camera. You even have a, they, you have a level. You, can, you have a measurement on there. Of course, it's a phone. It's, it's like a, you know, an address book. You don't need a Rolodex. Y'all remember the Rolodexes? You don't need those anymore. All of that within one device. I mean, not only do we have like, that kind of technology, we have a place called Chick-fil-A. I mean, I just, I just God, you didn't have to, but you, in our generation, God, thank you. That, you know, you can't have it today because they love Jesus too, but you can have it tomorrow, right? And, and, and not only that can you have it tomorrow, if you're really, you know, if you're busy, you can even have it delivered to your house or your office through DoorDash, right? We are living in a moment where we have at our disposal more opportunity, you know, and, and, and comfort and really, and, and just pleasure than any other generation. Yet every statistic tells us that we're more disillusioned than ever before. And I was on the phone the other night. It was actually at the marriage conference. I, was, I got about four or five text messages from a young man that I don't see very often who grew up here and he's moved off. And he was like, Pastor Mark, call me. Call me. It's urgent right now. And I, I step out. I have no idea what's coming. And we get on the phone for the next 20 minutes. He, he, he had literally called me and he said this. He said, I'm, I was about to take my life and I called you. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm just on the phone with him and I'm, I'm, I'm telling him the truth of God, that God has a plan for your life. And we're breaking this off of you. And before I hung up, making sure that he was connected with a person and, and then we were taking next steps with him spiritually, and I was so grateful that he called me, but as he shared his story of how he ended up there, he's tried everything the world has to offer at 23 years old. And he would say, as Solomon, and maybe some of us would say, and all this, all this pleasure, everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. That pleasure in and of itself will never get us to a place where we're healthy and fulfilled, right? It just can't. We gotta be careful of this and understand we live in this climate right now. We're surrounded by this idea that just more will make you happier and it doesn't. Here's the last thing. And this is the one that I'm really, I think most concerned about and that we've seen really we're, our lives are in the crosshair of this reality over the last few years, especially and that is a detachment from others that I think because we've walked away from truth and because we've filled our lives with pleasure and we've walked away from God's truth, that it's created this, this, this chasm, this breaking of relationships. And we're seeing that in marriages here at the church like never before. And I'm so grateful for every couple that was at the conference and for every couple that's fighting because these last two years have been intense in so many ways. And there's been an attack of the enemy on marriage and not just on marriage though, on friendships. I mean, there's been so many things to disagree about to have difference of an opinion on, whether it be you know, politics or your favorite sports team or even COVID itself, right? Over the last few years, we've seen broken friendships and so often even in a home, like sibling relationships. We can't even sit down at the table together because now we don't agree and, we just, and we've seen this detachment from each other. But hey, everybody, we need each other. <laughs> We need each other desperately and we cannot let the enemy, if I'm, I am so passionate about fighting against this today through the truth of God's word, we cannot let the enemy separate us. The truth is we are better together and the enemy would love to separate us so he can take us out. That's, that's what he's trying to do. If he can get us out of the group, if he can get us isolated, he knows he has the ability to take us out. And you've probably heard this verse, but 1 Peter 5, 8, Stay alert. And this is what I'm praying will rise up in all of us today. Realize this is a, this is a strategic attack of the enemy. These are, are not isolated things we're facing. All of this collectively is taking us into a reality. We got to watch out because our great enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion. And he is looking for someone to devour. And all of y'all have watched Discovery Channel, right? And you see those antelope and they're just so happy and they're running around everywhere. And when they're all together, they're safe. But who does the lion attack? Which one is the attack? It's not the ones in the pack, it's what? The ones who are outside the pack. Isolated and alone. And it's, he sees that and he goes after them and you have to cover your kid's eyes because it gets ugly really fast, right? That's what the enemy would love to do. And so again, the question that I hit you with, I wanna resolve the question and we're gonna get into 
the truth of God's word here today, but we need to ask ourselves, what if, if a healthy me is the key to a healthy us, what hope do we have when we live in the middle of this reality? The eye of the storm of deconstruction, disillusionment, and detachment. We're living right there in 2022. And I wanna make it really clear today, in the middle of the eye of their storm, I know you came to church today to get some clarity, maybe get some hope. Well, I'm gonna just hit you with it, y'all ready? What hope do we have right there in the middle of that storm? And the answer is this, none, zero, zilch. If we continue down our current pathway, I mean, human progress, We've arrived at, at least to this point in history, the pinnacle of human process. If we were ever gonna figure it out, come on somebody, we would have figured it out. We've arrived here in 2022 with all that we know and with all that we've experienced, this is where we've taken ourselves. And what hope do we have if we continue down this path? The answer is none. Does anyone remember the 90s? Oh, that was a dramatic shift right there. I felt that. Did y'all feel that tension of like, wow, what just happened? Wow. Where were, does anybody, anybody remember the 90s? Come on in. I remember the 90s. All right, all right, all right. The 90s were amazing. Beanie Babies? Simpler times. Urkel. That's a name you hadn't heard in a long time. Come on, Crystal Pepsi. Anybody remember that? Come on, TGIF? Macarena? The 90s? Does anybody remember the show Captain Planet? Come on, raise your hand if you remember. I was a kid in the 90s, all right? So if you don't remember it, there was this whole show called Captain Planet that was about fighting for the environment. Because really in the 90s, there was this, of course, big movement of environmental you know, protection and we got to save the environment. And they even created a cartoon about it, which is kind of funny when you think about it. And there was these characters, right? One of them represented earth and one of them represented fire and one of them was water and you know, one of them was wind and one of them was heart because you got to have heart, right? And when they, their forces combined, it was Captain Planet and Captain Planet came to rescue the planet. And in the middle of that culture, like environmentalism, there was, a, there was an experiment that, that some scientists got together to do to see if they could save the environment by creating what was called Biosphere 2. Does anybody remember bi Biosphere 2? Now, do not confuse this with Biodome, the Pauly Shore movie, all right? That's a different, that's a different thing, all right? But here, here's what Biosphere looked like. And this was an attempt by humanity to solve all the issues of the environment by using our collective knowledge and resources. So they created a perfect environment, a laboratory, and put you know, plants and animals and everything that was needed to make the absolute, untouched, perfect environment. Eight scientists went in, they locked the doors, and they said, we're going to live in here to show the world what a perfect environment looks like. Do you guys know that within two years, the whole thing had fallen apart? That there was a bacteria that had formed that was eating their oxygen. There were cockroaches everywhere because everything was rotting out. I mean, literally the trees were falling because they're, they're, they had no strength because there weren't enough elements like wind and other things, which that'll preach all in itself to create strength. There was, the roots had gone wide, but not deep. And two years later, this is what they said. We've tried to figure this out, but I guess we gotta realize, we, we've realized that nature had it right. And so we're gonna leave this environment and we're gonna go back. And I believe at the crossroads we're at right now, that there could be a sobering moment where we just recognize, hey everybody, we've tried to do it in every way we can, and this is not the moment to continue down that path. This is the moment to say, we're going back. God, we're looking to you. And here's what I'm believing with all of my heart, that if we will return, this is the truth of God's word, if we return, and this is the moment for it, if we return, our God will restore. That nothing is too far gone for our God. Come on, if you're gonna clap, Let's clap, that's a good point to clap. Nothing is too far gone. And we say that today. No marriage is too far gone, no friendship is too far gone, no dream is too far gone, nothing is too far gone. And if you struggle believing that, go do a re just a quick research project of the Bible and you will find dozens of verses about different people who had done things oftentimes way worse than even we've done in our cur current climate. And God's response to them was always, return to me and I'm gonna restore you. You're never too far gone. I love, here's just a couple of those verses. Zechariah says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. Don't we have an amazing God? And he wants you to know that today. You're, it's not too far gone. That a healthy me is the key to a healthy us, that no matter where we've been, God can restore us and then he can restore those around us. Job 22, 23, I love this verse. If you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. And I love the urgency here. So now is the time. Let's clean up our life. I just think February 27th, 2022 is a great day for us to say, I'm going back and I'm trusting God to restore. 
I know who he is. I know what, that, he's, that he has the power to do it. And it's time to fully put myself into that journey, into, into God's truth. And to unpack this t- today, there's, a, there's a, a Bible story I want to tell you, which I think is such a perfect, the Bible is such a roadmap for us in anything that we're facing. We can look to God's word and find a way through it. And Israel is oftentimes a great place to look in the Old Testament because they truly are a model for us that we can study. We live in our own moment, but we are able to observe their moment. And oftentimes what they went through, we go through ourselves. And so Israel, if you don't know their history, they had been formed as a nation under King David, but very quickly they had fallen away from God. I mean, he'd done miracles for them, yet they fell away from God. And they were literally divided into two kingdoms. There was Israel and there was Judah. And over just a, a, a 15, 14, 15 generations of kings, things, there, were, there were moments of hope, but things really went from bad to worse. And their entire culture was really a lot like what we're looking at today, to be honest with you. We really can't say what we're going through is unprecedented. The Bible actually shows us a nation who went through many of the same things that we've looked at in our own generation. And, and there's a king named Ammon who, who dies, and, and after his death, kind of at the worst moment of, his, of Judah's history, his son Josiah becomes king. Josiah is only eight years old when he becomes king. And the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I really believe Josiah kind of looked to the right and left. And he was like, guys, this is not working. There's got to be a better way. And 18 years into his rule, so now he's, what, 24 years old, he begins to remodel the temple. And in the temple of God, the priest, as they're remodeling, find a book. And they run back to Josiah with this book. And they're really excited. And they say, we have found a book of the covenant. Scholars believe this is the book of Deuteronomy. And immediately Josiah has the priest begin to read to him that book. And they thought there was no hope. They thought it was always gonna be this way. And out of nowhere, like a bolt of lightning, like I'm praying happens in our own hearts today, they recognize, no, no, we're not too far gone. There is a way back. And they begin to read that book. And this is what Josiah does next. And I love this. He acted immediately, which again, I think that's our response today. Whatever else happens today, it's the spirit of it is. This is a moment for a strong reaction. The king acted immediately, assembling all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. Then the king proceeded to the temple of God, bringing everyone in his train, the priests and the prophets. Isn't this so good, everybody? People ranging from the famous to the unknown. Everybody, you got to come hear what I just heard. This is going to change everything. There's a way back. We're not too far gone. Then he read out publicly everything written in the book of the covenant that was found in the temple of God. The king stood by the pillar, and before God, he solemnly committed to all of them, committed all of them to the covenant. We'll come back to that. To follow God believingly and obediently, to follow his instructions, heart and soul, on what to believe and what to do, to put into practice the entire covenant and all that was written in the book. And the people stood in affirmation. Their commitment was unanimous. Come on, God, do that in our time. He's done it before. I pray that he would do that again in our time. And they find this beautiful book. And I love that the first point on the roadmap to restoration for them was a renewal of the covenant. And you know, when we think about the covenant, we often think of the 10 commandments and and that's a powerful part of the covenant. But before you can ever think about the rules of the covenant, you gotta recognize those were always given in relationship. That God wanted them to know how to live and the way that that was gonna happen is for them to know who they were. That that was, all, that was what the heart of the covenant was, to know their identity and truly who they were. And so I'm going to read you guys one of the verses. This is so cool to me about God's word. Here we are thousands of years, late, years later, and I'm going to read out of the book of De- Deuteronomy. These are the same words that I believe would have caught Josiah's heart. It's Deuteronomy 28.10. Then all the people on earth, this is God speaking, will see that you are called by the name of of the Lord and they will fear you. Here's the first thing I believe God's gonna do when we return to him completely. When we return, he restores our identity. God is a restorer of our identity. You aren't just some random group of people. You are my children. And if you don't know who you are, this is a great quote, write this down. If you don't know who you are, then you're not gonna know how to live. And man, that is so true about our culture right now in America. I believe we are facing collectively an identity crisis. I mean, everywhere we look, it's like we don't know, we've forgotten who we really are. And you know, the current headline around that idea would be gender, but really that's just a symptom of, a, of something, a sickness that's been happening for a long time. We don't know who we are. 
And when you don't know who you are, you just don't know how to live. And maybe that's where you are right now. And for some of you, you've ended up there because you know, maybe the environment you grew up in with your, your dad or your mom, or maybe the absence of them, you never had anyone who affirmed you with identity and spoke life over who you were. So your whole life, you've kind of been out there, you feel like on your own trying to figure this thing out. Who am I? What's my life all about? Or maybe for you, it was negative words that were spoken. You could have even grown up in a great environment, but there was a coach or a teacher or someone who maybe not even knew what they were doing, but they spoke something over your life. And that now has, has taken hold of you in a strong way. And it's pushed you away from the truth of who you really are. For others of us, of us it's not what happened to us, but it's really us being defined by what we do that, that shapes our identity. I mean, what my, who I am is my job. Who I am is, you know, what I do every day. My achievement defines who I am. And man, when that goes away, like you lose a job or you retire or how about this? Maybe your kids graduate and you've been a parent. That's been the identity. But now who am I really? It can rip at the threads of our identity. And if we don't know who we are, we're not going to know how to live. And it's a, it's a destructive thing in our own lives. And it destroys the relationships around us. This is a quote from Dr. Les Parrott. He says, if you try to build intimacy or relationship with another person before you've gotten whole on your own, all your relationships become attempt to complete yourself. So we wear identity like clothes. And if this one doesn't work, we try the next one out. And every statistic says that lack of identity creates uncertainty. It creates a lack, lack of confidence. It creates fear. It creates anxiety. Any of these words sound familiar? They're oftentimes rooted in, I'm, I, I just, I'm, I'm walking around without any tether, any anchor to identity. And it creates ultimately an insecurity where every environment I am, I'm always, I just don't feel quite like I fill in. And so I just, the people around me all become an attempt to complete myself. I know this because I have faced throughout my life in different seasons, an identity crisis with who I am. And it's not just when I was young, but I tell you what, the first one I really remember was as a middle schooler or coming out of middle school in, in ninth grade. And y'all know I love you. I'm about to show you ninth grade Mark right there. I went back to the yearbook. All right. So y'all, that's, that's something your mom should only see, but I'm showing all of y'all. This is to be honest with you, it's because I was thinking back, I was, I was praying for anyone here who wouldn't know their identity, and I was thinking back to different moments in my own life. And what you're seeing right there, which I mean, the part down the center right there in the hair, what y'all can't see, I'm wearing white jeans. I remember those white jeans we used to wear in the 90s. It was not cool, but we thought it was cool. Everything about me in this season was full of insecurity and fear. I remember walking every day into school and okay, what do I have to do to fit in with this group? And I wasn't really athletic enough to be part of the jocks. I wasn't smart enough to be part of the nerds. They didn't want me and they didn't want me. And so I was just always trying to fit in anywhere I could. And I was miserable, full of so much insecurity. And there was nothing I wouldn't have done, nothing I wouldn't have tried. I, luckily, I grew up in a place that had limited opportunity, although I made a lot of mistakes. Or what, I could have done anything at any time because honestly, I was just so desperate for identity. And there have been other moments in my life, even now heading towards, you know, my, my midlife. I'm in my 40, I just turned 40 this year. There's been other moments along the journey where I faced another moment of identity crisis. But I tell you what I learned in this moment that I've carried with me ever since then is I'm not going to solve this problem myself. If you hear anything else, know this. Gen, uh, our identity, gender, or who we are, or whatever else, it's not fluid. It is rooted. It's rooted in a truth. We don't have to figure it out ourselves. We can look to that truth. If, 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 we don't know, if we don't know who we are, we won't know how to live, but the opposite is also true. And I'm believing this over your life today. When I know who I am, I know how to live. When I know who I am, I know how to live. How do we know who we are? We look to the word of the one who created us, who has the right, the only one who has the right to tell us who we are. If you want a practical application for identity, it is to speak the word of truth over your life. It's not about, I mean, devotional reading we need. We need to study God's word and we need to learn God's word. And those things are a part of our life with God's words. We also need to proclaim the word of God. You are a son or a daughter of the living God. God is for you, not against you. You are a city on a hill. You are above, not beneath. You are the head, not the tail. If God is for you, who can be against you? He made you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. And all of hell can come against you. But it does not change no matter what you've done or what you believe. It does not change the truth. You are a child of God. And we need to proclaim that over our life. I was with a mentor this week, just sharing him this message, sharing this message with me. He's in his late 50s. He tells me he's successful. Everything about him would say, this guy knows who he is. He says, every single day, I have to proclaim the word of God. 20 minutes over my life. And I was, I was convicted. I need to do more of this over my own life. 
my kids' life, what they need, they, they need best practices, and they need to study, they need to excel in, in, in sports. We spend so much time on that, we forget the core of who they are as their identity, and we need to spend as much time we're doing all of that proclaiming God's word over them. And we have an amazing friend in our church who just this year gave us these pictures. And, I, and these are, I mean, they're everywhere on the internet. We just didn't have them in our home, but I'm so grateful. Miss Joy gave us a picture that has us, the name of each of our sons and then seven verses about their identity. And it's hanging over their beds. They see it every single day. Come on, we need to proclaim the word of God over all of our lives because it destroys the attack of the enemy. And version is a great resource. They have many Bible studies around identity. There are many different ways to find your verses, but here's the challenge. Let's all have a proclamation over our own lives. Maybe wherever the enemies try to hit you specifically, find a verse for that, and then let's declare it over every, every one of our lives every single day, and God's gonna restore our identity. But it doesn't stop there. I love the next point on this journey, on this journey uh, with, with, the, with King Josiah and the Israelites. This is 2 Kings 23. And you know, they've had this moment where they've restored their identity. And it, he doesn't stop there though. It says, then the king ordered Hilkiah, the high priest, his associate priest and the temple sentries to clean house. It's like, we know who we are. Oh my goodness, we're not living right. Some things need to actually change. And they go on just this rampage. We're about to say a word. Come on everybody that... It's one of those good church words, a rampage of repentance. And he just goes after it. And there's a tons of verses in this chapter. I'm just gonna read a few of them. They wanted to get rid of everything in the temple of God that had been made for worshiping Baal and Asherah and the cosmic powers. Then Josiah demolished the, the Topheth, the iron furnace, griddle set up in the valley of Ben Hanam for sacrificing children in the fire. That's how bad it had gotten in Israel. Can I tell you something? We don't do that physically. We gotta be careful though in our culture right now, we are sacrificing our kids in a culture of impurity. Come on as adults, we gotta fight against the strongholds because they're living in the reality of many of the things that we've grown up through, but now they're getting it at a double portion. We gotta fight for them like never before. No longer could anyone burn son or daughter to the God of Molech, but Josiah, and this is, I love his energy, and go read it. He had not finished yet. He had just gotten started. He rips it all more than any other king. There was, the Bible says there was no one else like him in Israel. He did not stop. He got rid of, he, they, they said he even dug up bones of false prophets and got rid of them. He cleaned house. Because here's the truth. When we return, God can restore our purity. When we return, God can restore our purity. No matter how far gone it feels, he can restore it. For me, purity was always a word I couldn't really relate to or actually I was afraid of. You know, like, because when I heard purity, I thought about how I had already messed up and it felt like there was no way back. Like purity felt like guilt. Purity felt like shame. Purity felt like a burden. But one night when I was 17, right soon after the picture I showed you, and I was still trying on all these different identities, I walked in First Baptist Church of Ashland, Alabama. I didn't walk into the church building. Come on, somebody. I walked into the Family Life Center. Anybody remember a Family Life Center? You can smell it right now, right? Can you see it? Come on. One day it's a wedding reception hall. The next day it's a lock-in. Whatever you do, don't sit on the carpet because it's, it's been, it ain't been cleaned in a while, right? It's just like multi-purpose to the core. And I walk in this building and I was there. I wasn't there for God. I could, could have cared less about God. I was just trying to find out who I was. And for me at that moment, it meant finding a girlfriend. I went to church for a girl. Some of y'all got that testimony. Don't, don't judge me, all right? I went to church for a girl and I found God, whatever it takes, right? And she invited me and I walk in, wasn't looking for God, but this, this guy starts preaching like passion and fire. And the topic of that night was a sermon called True Love Waits. And it was all about purity. And all I know is this, I didn't even get saved that night, but what I felt was there, there was a way back. And the night that pastor preached that message, it changed. I wouldn't be here today without that pastor's message. And can I tell y'all something really cool? He's sitting on the front row today. It's your campus pastor, Blake Lindsay. I was 17 years old, he was 20. I love you. He saved my life. I was accidentally in the house of God, but I heard God's truth, which by the way, that's why this parent meeting today is so important. What we're doing in student ministry, get your kids to the house of God, whatever it takes. We're going to preach this truth. I would not be here today without that sermon. And I realized purity is not a burden, it's a blessing. And that there is a way back. And, and purity, what purity does is it creates the opportunity, the environment for intimacy. I can, I can be close to God and others because now they're not an object to use for me they're a person to value and to love and that it creates that value. I love how the Bible talks about purity. It's blessed, blessed are the pure. Blessed are they because they're gonna, they're gonna see God. So in a, in a culture, and I don't need to rehearse the stats, in a culture that's so impure, how do we get back? 
You know, pornography stats are unbelievable. $90 billion a year, everybody. A 65-year-old man and woman in America is just as likely to be addicted to porn as an 18-year-old now. This is not just one group, it's all of us facing temptations. And, and of course, pornography is just one piece of that, but sexual impurity in general, it's ripping at the fabric of relationships in every way, marriages and divorces and friendships. And, but it's not just sexual, it's in many other ways that we've bought into pleasure and we've given ourselves over to impurity, to corruption. Here's another big church word, how about depravity, just doing things our own way. What do we do with all of that? Well, the first thing we gotta do is understand this, that is called sin. But sin, we're like, I can't call it sin, that brings shame, no, 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 no. Maybe that's our problem. We've, we've wanted to call those things habits or mistakes or problems. Those things are sin, but sin does not bring shame. Sin brings hope because my Jesus came to set me free from sin. If I call it what it is, he can set me free of it. That's the first step to understanding a life of freedom. I'm gonna call it what it is and his blood shed on Calvary can set me free of that. And he can you in my life and he can in your life. Never too far gone. Never too far gone. How do we experience it? Number one, we just ask God to reveal any area of our life. Come on, this is powerful. It's a powerful prayer. Any area of my life where I've chosen my own way. God, show me. Then we gotta follow that up by being willing to repent of it. Repentance is not guilt or shame. And guess what? Repentance is also not just being sorry. I think oftentimes we think we've repented where we're just sorry for it. No, no, no. Repentance goes a level beyond that and says, I was wrong, God, you're right. I let go of that, I choose you. I'm turning 180 degrees this way. I'm going away from me towards you. And when we do that, God can set us free. And just as, with, with, as a show of hands, anybody in here ever been set free of anything in your life by God? Come on, let's, let's testify today. If he can set you free of that, then whatever it is you're currently facing, he can set you free of that too. If he set me free in one area, it can be any area. We believe that with all of our heart. Come on, let's attack any area of impurity and let God redeem it, let God restore it, let God show us the power of what he can do. When he sets us free, our mess becomes our message. That's what I love about our church. We have small groups where we can connect relationally, confess our sins, and then we have dream team ministry for us to live out the testimony of God's faithfulness in our life to show other people. And that's what this church has always been about. Here's our last step, and we're gonna pray together. The king, this is back to Josiah, commanded the people now, now we've, we've found our identity. We're, we're sons and daughters of God. We've purified the nation. What do we do next? We're gonna celebrate the Passover to God, your God, exactly as directed in this book of the covenant. This commanded Passover had not been celebrated since the days that the judges judged Israel. So not even David did this. None of the kings of Israel and Judah had celebrated it. But in the 18th year of the rule of King Josiah, this very Passover was celebrated to God in Jerusalem. And what I love about the Passover, of course it celebrates the miracle of God's rescue from Egypt. But what I love most about the Passover, it was a collective celebration that was all about, write this down, restoring unity. And if the ultimate attack of the enemy right now is detachment, we've gotta recognize that the ultimate work God would love to do, I believe in our lives, in our relationships, is a work of unity. And everything he's, the enemy's been trying to do is to rip us apart. We have a moment right now to say, you know what? We're gonna link in together. And I'm believing, we're, we're in a year of great faith. I'm believing this is the year for unified marriages, not just we're still together, a step way beyond that of unity. Unified friendships, unified, come on, racially unified, culturally unified, collectively unified. Not that we're always gonna agree. And by the way, differences, God made us all different. That's not what we're trying to solve. Unity goes above that to recognize that we have something deeper in common that could ever, than could ever try to separate us. We have the image of God inside of us. So instead of starting at our differences and trying to find a way to do life together, we started our unity and then we work through our problems one by one. That's the pathway God wants to take us to, is realizing we are truly better together and we're never too far gone. And this is so deep in the heart of God. In fact, this is the ultimate blessing of life, unity. Because when we're unified, we're most like God. Look at John 17. It says, the same glory you gave me, I give them. So they'll be unified and together as we are, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We have the opportunity to be just as unified as they are in them and with each other. I and them and you and me, then they'll mature in this oneness. And God wants to bless us with unity, a renewed unity. And it is for us and it is for those around us, but it goes a step beyond that. This unity will give the godless world evidence. The world's looking for hope. Hey, everybody, the greatest evangelistic tool of 2022 probably isn't a sermon or a song. It's the unity of God's house. If they can do life together, there must be a God. If they can all figure out their way through these situations, my goodness, I need what they have. 
give the godless world evidence that you've sent me and love them in the same way that you have loved me. The bottom line is this, in identity and in purity and in unity, if we return, God can restore. Can I get an amen today as we celebrate? Well, that's the truth of the word of God. All right, let's pray together. And I want us to keep every campus together as we close out today. We're gonna, even as a demonstration of this message, pray together and then we're gonna worship together in a moment of unity at every campus, every location. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want us to reflect. This is, this is a moment for me just to give you opportunity. The word of God does all of the work. And if God is speaking to you, this is a chance to respond. I'm not gonna call you down front or embarrass you in any way. But you know, when we talk about identity, really the core of our identity being a child of God, we can't live in that truth unless we belong to him. We've given our life to him. And I, just, I do not wanna finish today without giving anyone here an opportunity to respond to the Lord, to respond to Jesus and make him your Lord and savior. And then after that, I wanna pray for purity. You're know, thinking about the blood that Jesus shed for us to receive the forgiveness of sins, to allow any area of our life that we've carried in to be impacted by that truth today. Two prayers today, starting with one for salvation. I'm not gonna call you down front, not gonna embarrass you. Everyone has got their head bowed and eyes closed. I can, I'm looking around the room. No one's gonna point you out in any way, but you know that you need to respond today to that truth. Maybe as a first time commitment to God, but maybe it's a recommitment to God. If that's you on the count of three, lift your hands and we're gonna pray together. One, two, three. Come on, I already see hands up right now all over the room. Amen, amen. Praise God, amen. Hands up. I'm expecting that at every campus. I believe that's happening. Right there in the, in the middle, I see your hand. I see that hand, great job. It's awesome. Why don't you put your hands down, pray with me if that's you. And this is a powerful moment. Just pray these words and mean them. You can pray them out loud or even in your own heart. Jesus, say, I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins, my mistakes. I turn away from all of that. And God, I'm running to you. Be my Lord, my Savior. And God, fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can live my life for you. Just finish your prayer out by saying these words. I am a Christian. I'm a child of God. God, thank you for every one of their lives. We bless them today as they pursue you with all of their heart. Anyone in the sound of my voice that walked in with any area of sin in your life that you've been managing, but you're ready to be finished with. You're, you've, been, you've been managing it, but you're ready to conquer it today. It's not gonna be through our power, it's through his power. And you can just sit there and pray your own prayer, but can I pray over you, God, right now? I pray for anyone in this place who you've revealed to them an area of sin in their life, an area of, that's just, just we've been trying to do it our own way. And God, together we ask for you, for the, the blood of Jesus, the power of what you did on the cross to work in that area, to break off those chains, to break through that stronghold, to crush the area the enemy has been trying to take us out with. God, we say it is broken in Jesus' name. Addictions are broken. Hope is being filled into people's hearts. And God, we're just thankful that as a Christian, we have this opportunity to experience what only you can do. And God, I pray that as we walk out of this place, we will be fooled, not with filled not with shame or guilt, but with hope and with life and with joy, knowing that you have done a real work inside of us. And we just promise to use it for your glory. We'll turn our mess into our message. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Can you help me just celebrate what God's done today? It's incredible.